Exciting. Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Ben Dowling. I'm the Cabinet Member for Culture, Leisure and Economic Development at Portsmouth City Council and welcome to this afternoon's meeting. Um, I've got a long script of things to say but the highlights are to ensure that we've all done our COVID tests to make sure that we're okay to be in the building. Lots of nodding which is positive. I've done mine as well. Um, there is public seating available although no one has chosen to join us this afternoon uh, but if anybody's watching on the live stream, welcome. Um, and please make sure we remain two metres apart throughout the meeting in order to continue adhering to the risk assessment for the meeting. Um, if the fire alarm goes, we can no longer meet in the usual point because we've put an ice rink in the middle of the square. So if we could please exit uh, to the side of the building and meet at the turning circle at the end of the road, that would be wonderful. Um, and there are cameras, so uh, I hope you sat in the right place to get your best side. Um, there are no deputations for today's meeting, so we'll move swiftly on. Apologies for absence. Oh no, I should do introductions first. Um, shall we go round? If we start on this side, then we'll go that way. Hello, Christine Taylor of Cumberland House Natural History Museum. Jane Mee, Museums and Visitor Services Officer. Claire Looney, Commissioning and Partnership Manager. Claire Watkins, Business Manager. Council of Signs. Thank you. Jane. Jane Singh, Tourism and Marketing Manager. Joe Dowling, Business Project Manager, The Hot Walls. Emma Martin, Democratic Services. Wonderful, thank you very much everyone. So we'll move to the uh, formal agenda. Apologies for absence. I've had apologies from Councillor Tom Coles, who's the Labour representative on this uh, area of the Council. He's got family commitments. And Councillor Claire UD, who's the Portsmouth Progressive Independent Group. That's not right, but um, the other group on the Council and is at a conference away from the city today. So the apologies are noted. Uh, we'll move on to declarations of interest. I do not have any council signs, nothing. Okay, wonderful. That takes us to item three, which is the Hot Walls, Hot Walls Studios update. Jo. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we're pleased to bring the uh, update. It's a 20-month update for the Hot Wall Studios. Uh, Christy McQueen, who's the Hot Walls Development Manager, couldn't be here today, but we both wrote the report. Um, it really reflects all our work, which is uh, quite extensive. But it's quite a complex offer down there. So. Um, uh, please forgive us the report's a little bit on the long side. I don't aim to go through it all today, but I just thought I'd pick out a few highlights. Um, one of which is we're very pleased that the artists all got their funding from the government, which meant that they could continue uh, in the way that they have, and we had very few casualties at the Hot Walls. Um, on top of that, we levered an external funding from the Arts Council as well on a couple of bids, and we worked with the museums and the Cultural Recovery Fund. Um, we also uh, also talked about our economic development achievements, which we're always proud of in terms of job and secondary spend. And also, we talked a little bit in the report about the supported environment that we do in terms of um, supporting the businesses um, with one-to-one -one business reviews, uh, funding bid support, um, and exhibition support, curatorial support. Um, it's quite a, it's a real supported environment down there for those 13 artists. We couldn't really not do the report without showing our creative successes, even over the last 18, uh, 18 to 20 months with lockdown. And they were, they were mostly based in London um, um, with various art shows and exhibitions, um, and which we're very proud of. And some of the artists, because they developed their online sales, uh, they also uh, had more of a global reach uh, with, with, the, with the work. Facilities is always a huge issue for us in terms of its very challenging environment, the, the marine environment on one side and then working with um, um, a sort of scheduled monument. And so we did a lot of facilities uh, work this year and we still have a number of challenges to face. Our events program is finally starting to come back after a sort of post-COVID environment and um, we're pleased to say that we secured a permanent post to deliver uh, that for the first time. It was always a two-year temporary post and we managed to, to get a permanent post down there to deliver events and support Chrissy. 
The digital side for us is really important. We're currently developing an online gallery and we're trying to get a broader reach of our audiences and we've also established a social media strategy. But it goes without saying that although we built up a lot of success and we are recovering, there's always challenges for the site. And the challenges for the site, I feel the biggest challenge for us is to develop the round tower. It's the final piece for the jigsaw and wasn't part of the coastal community's bid. It's our largest indoor space. It needs a lot of uh, tender loving care in terms of external structure, internal structure, making it safe, making it multi-use for the community and an inspiring in creative space, which I know it can be, because we do have limited events in there, but at the moment, um, just a little bit on the wet side to be able to, to put anything in really for more than two days. So for me, it's um, we recovered well, we're still growing, but we can't stand still, and I think we have to rise to the challenges. Uh, of the round tower, make sure that we try and get to Reba stage three so that we can get some internal investment for that to lever in external funding. Thank you. I don't know if you have any questions. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Joe. No questions from me, and the, the, the subtle bid for internal funding is noted. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and actually, the hot walls. We, you know, every report we get about the hovels is just more positive news and actually I think that's a general theme throughout today but um, actually for me it represents such a multifaceted offer both in terms of what it does for local creatives and creativity generally but also in terms of what it does for a historic asset and, and obviously the public facing side and the economic development benefits as well so it's one of those council projects which has so many parts to it which isn't just facing in one direction which I think is really helpful um, so but lots of really positive work and some of those forward-looking comments are, are noted uh, Councillor Symes comments or questions just comments, actually. Um, I think it's great that more of the studio is being shared which, in, which, in, sorry, which enables them to stay open longer because I think that was the problem in the beginning that lots of people couldn't understand why they were closed I think the six years is a bit long and Joe knows my views on that. Um, but I'm very pleased to see it doing so well, and especially since uh, the epidemic, it's still come back just as strong as it was before. So, yeah, congratulations, Joe. And the team, and everyone else who worked on it, of course. Yeah, I think there's a general acknowledgement that actually it's been so successful that it, it is a proven model now and it's how do we provide other spaces for those same sorts of opportunities and then the step up space for those artists and creatives going forward and we know that's a challenge as a council and as a city but we are working on it uh, for lack of detail. Um, thanks very much Joe. Um, I think it's just for information so there's no kind of decision to make as such. Um, so thank you very much for the information. Um, I think it's important that we bring these things back even though there's no decision to make. It's helpful that the public have a mechanism for knowing this information um, in a kind of a public reporting way. So that's really positive. Okay, we'll move on to uh, the Visit Portsmouth marketing update. That takes us to uh, Jane. Hello, yes, thank you. So this report provides an update on marketing activity undertaken by the Visit Portsmouth team in 2021 as we moved through periods of lockdown into recovery. Um, supporting our partners and ensuring that the, we and they were abreast of national and regional developments throughout the pandemic has been a key activity and we launched our tourism recovery plan in March to aid with the support. In addition, the previously agreed Visit Parts of Marketing Communications Plan 21-22 will continue to inform marketing throughout next year and we'll update that as required given changes in markets, developments and restrictions and everything else. Uh, some key points to note achievements. Um, the creation and distribution of the Visit Portsmouth publications and the continuation of the promotion of the city through the Visit Portsmouth website and social media channels, including the virtual Ports Portsmouth aspects that we did during lockdowns. Uh, we launched Portsmouth Put the Wind in Your Sails uh, marketing campaign and we used this across our main season campaign with partners. And one thing that was extremely heartening was given the terrible time people have had to see that they were still willing to put a continued that financial buy-in um, two main season campaigns with us during this difficult time. We amplified that through the Welcome Back Fund activity, which was funding through the government, and that also enabled us to do additional activities such as the Waterfront Welcome Team and the much appreciated Seafront Trail that we produced and distributed. 
Uh, we also back that up with some more activity to encourage visits to South Sea because we recognise that those businesses have had quite a bad time and needed a bit more support. We've continued regional and national activity with Visit Hampshire, Tourism South East, uh, England's Coast, which we're part of, and Visit England, Visit Britain. And we've also continued to carry out activity as the group market, business market and international markets start some recovery and that will obviously be a focus going into next year. And we work with the international port and obviously support the cruise market as part of that. Lots more information in the attachments, I won't go into it all. There are two recommendations which is to agree the continued marketing as outlined in the report and the previously approved communications plan and note the achievements of the team and also acknowledge the support from destination partners which has been key this year. That's it. Any questions? Okay, thank you Jane. Again, lots of very positive information there and the fact that we work with partners to make our money go so far I think is a testament to the work we do and actually lots of local authorities pour lots of money into their marketing budgets and then uh, but don't achieve the impact that we do with a considerably smaller amount of money. So I think that's a testament to you and the team for how we utilise that spend and, and it, that's shown in this report. Um, Councillor Symes. Yes, I'm glad the London Underground uh, is successful again, and I think Put the Wind in Your Sails is a fantastic slogan. Whoever thought it up, Jane? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, yes, I'm pleased to see it doing so well. It was a collaboration with the marketing group with partners, The Wind in Your Sails. <laughs> Wonderful. In which case, um, that is approved, um, although. Uh, well, there is a recommendation, although it's to continue doing what we're doing. Um, so in, uh, I think that's a recommendation because we wanted to put one in there. Um, but that's okay. So um, agreed as per the paperwork, which in case anybody's watching is to continue marketing as outlined in the report and previously approved comms plan, noting the achievements of the team and acknowledging the support from destination partners. Um, okay. Thank you, Jane. We'll now go to Jane. Not other Jane, um, on the museum strategy for the next five years. Thank you very much, Councillor Dowling. Uh, so, this document sets out our aspirations and objectives for the next five years. Um, our current museum strategy is up for review. Um, this document is essential for accreditation, which is a national benchmark, and it will also underpin a bid in the new year for national portfolio organisation status with Arts Council England. Um, just to say, although Arts Council will be overwhelmed with bids, it will be a very competitive process, we feel it's something we have to do for the city. Um, the museum strategy has been informed by facilitated workshops with staff, and we also had a peer challenge review undertaken by the Chief Exec of Derby Museums Trust. These were both pre-COVID. And during COVID, we actually had a couple of facilitated workshops with a small number of stakeholders. They were virtual. Um, but further consultation is required and that, as expressed in the recommendations. I think the key, the key thing for me about the strategy, it's, we would, we're looking to be more about benefiting communities in terms of well-being, skills and learning, community cohesion, and ideally less about managing buildings. We do have a lot of buildings to manage, but I suppose that's the nature of the city. Um, and our core purpose and strategic objectives reflect, reflect that. So if I could draw your attention to our core purpose at uh, 4.3 in the report, to give local communities and individuals the opportunity to engage with the city's amazing heritage and people, to tell their story, be inspired, learn new things, gain new skills, and feel happier and more optimistic about the future. And the vision at 4.4, create a new museum of Portsmouth in partnership with the city's communities, which captures the spirit of Portsmouth and is at the heart of the city, and that the vision is as much about our approach to creating content as, as to being something about a building, and our strategic objectives be more relevant to our residents, more representative, more inclusive, be more in the thick of it, and this is about being more outward facing and less inward facing, which I think we have been in terms of developing the new D-Day Museum and then Landing Craft Tank. It's, you know, we've had to focus our resources on getting the job done. Um, and also being more environmentally sustainable and resilient. So they're, so they're the key elements of the museum strategy. Um, I think that's all I really want to say, and then just, just saying that the next step really is a wider consultation. We haven't had the opportunity to consult that we would have liked. 
Wonderful, thank you. Um, and again, another really positive thing going looking forward. Um, I think the focus on people and communities is, is perhaps the most important part of the strategy because quite often the stereotype around museums is that they are a place that visitors go and see once in their lifetime but actually museums ha are more than just the buildings as you've, as you've articulated and how we get local people to engage in that um, is really really important so um, so thank you for that um, and I feel very positive about our hopes of the MPO funding next year um, inevitably Every organisation in the city uh, that has anything to do with creativity will be going for the same funding uh, and there are some councils who actively choose to not put themselves forward for that in order to not compete uh, with partners but actually I think we have an offer and a service that is worthy and we should therefore shout about it and if getting that additional funding ultimately will be to the benefit of the whole city including lots of those partners that will also be seeking the funding so um, I think that's really really helpful. Um, I, I'm very happy with the, the direction of travel. Councillor Sines? I, I think that we're lucky in this city that we actually just don't have static museums, but they're, they're live things. We've got the Butterfly House in with Cumberland House, which uh, brings its own um, demographic to the whole system. We then have all our other museums at which the staff do try to put on as many events and keep it as interesting as possible and I think that's the secret that's why we keep getting good visitor numbers is because it's not just a place to go and look around as you have already said and, and I think all, all credit to the staff who work extremely hard to uh, to make that happen thank you councillor and a, a bit like my comment around Jane's report Jane Singh's report um, we do we do an enormous amount with a relatively small amount of money and for a city of the size we are we have a lot of museums um, and so again in terms of value for money for local taxpayers or in, you know, local residents I think it's significant as, as a service so um, again a, a positive reflection of the work that's happening um, again I think we've got a series of recommendations that are um, really positive and helpful but essentially just to continue as as we are doing which is great um, so recommendations approved as written which again for the record are that the achievements of the museum service over the past five years um, are noted and that the draft museum strategy goes out for public consultation that a revised document informed by the views of stakeholders including both users and non-users of the service is presented to cabinet at the earliest opportunity and Jane do we have a, a time frame for it what, what is the time frame for Hope to bring it back ideally in January but I have learned today that our marketing lead has is has recent is, is resigned or is resigning, so that might hold things up a little bit. I shall have to think how to go to get around that. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, noted with the, with the caveat, um, but actually, the, making sure we move this forward swiftly is important. Um, and actually, given that a cornerstone of the draft is about engaging local people I'm hoping that local people will say that that's a positive thing um, but we shall see okay um, we've had mention of Cumberland House um, so without further ado let's hear about the disaster management plan thank you Councillor Dowling um, so um, my report is uh, based on a disaster management plan for um, the butterfly house at Cumberland House uh, we actually hold a zoo license, and the zoo license is one of the catches all, so it's for every zoo, regardless of its size. Um, as part of Section 1A um, of the zoo license, um, we need to ensure that, um, with respect to what we do with respect to escaping animals, which in our case are butterflies, um, so we need to think about what we do in the instance of that. Um, we also need to think about all the, the the uh, plan looks at the ethics of displaying and sorting exotic butterflies, uh, making sure that they are cared for humanely at all stages of their life cycle, uh, comply with the rules and regulations of the breeding and transport of them, the rearing of them, and also to educate the general public about our butterflies and our natural, our natural habitats. Um, something we did need to think about was the parameters of what constitutes the butterfly house. Um, so, which that's basically the greenhouse, the foyer outside, that, and the lab, and can, that can have implications um, if one sort of just escapes just out the side of the door in the uh, foyer, 
Um, in that case, we can just pop it back in again. If it goes any further, we need to think about reporting it. So I've actually attached a flow chart of what we do in that um, instance. Um, I've also um, addressed the uh, potential risk to butterflies to escape handling diseases and pests, uh, damage to greenhouse, loss of power, fire, flood, power utility and outage, and also loss of food plants, um, which is another thing we need to think about because the food plants are there to actually uh, feed the butterflies at all stages of their lifestyle and life um, stage. Um, so the butterfly management plan is attached. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, an interesting document that I had never in a million years prior to becoming councillor thought I would ever need to read, um, but a very important and interesting document. I find it somewhat entertaining that the reporting mechanisms for a lion escaping Marwell Zoo are pretty much the same as Butterfly Leaves Cumberland House. Um, but. Uh, it, important that we report these things nonetheless. Um, I, I have no issues with, with it going forward um, and um, presumably this is just for information anyway. Uh, Councillor Symes. I think we were all amazed when we found we had to have a zoo licence. We hadn't realised and then suddenly it was brought to our attention and we couldn't believe it, could we? It was just... We learn new things as members every day. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Um, we'll move swiftly forward. Um, Great South Run update. Is this Claire or Claire? Claire. Councillor Dowling, thank you. So this is an information item really just to let you know formally that we have recently concluded the negotiations with the Great South Run through Nova International and we have secured the Great South Run in Portsmouth for a further period of three plus two years. So it is a renegotiated contract which um, we're delighted to really um, bring to attention to this committee to just make sure that you're aware that that's concluded. Um, the core offer will still be very much the same, so it's a 10 mile mass participation event, along with then a series of shorter run distances, all of which still seem quite daunting to me, of a 5k event, a 2.5k event and a mini event at 1.5k. Um, the smaller events take place on the first of the two days of the weekend, the Saturday, and the mass participation event takes place on the Sunday. So. NOVA International have also agreed to undertake a further economic impact assessment report, which we think is very important in terms of being able to demonstrate the additional value that that brings in, both in terms of secondary spend, but also about some of the changes in perceptions of the city and things like that by participating in our beautiful city on a very flat, wonderfully fast course, which enables lots of international runners to get new personal bests and record times. So we know there's an ongoing challenge with ensuring that live sports remain live feed as opposed to streaming services, and we'll continue to work with NOVA to maximise that opportunity. And also, we are mindful of the Coastal Defence Scheme, which at some point will possibly have a little impact on some areas of the running race, but we've got a range of contingencies, and I can assure you they won't just be lapping the common, so to speak. It will still be an interactive race all around the south part of the city. So um, tickets are on sale for 2022 already, should you wish to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Oh, well, perhaps I'll participate if we, if you're my running mate, and we'll do it together. How does that sound? Um, you know, joking aside, the Great South Run has an incredibly positive impact on the city, both for residents and visitors who come as a result of it. Um, and even without live TV, the economic benefit is clear. But obviously, the work you've described is is welcomed and important. Um, but also we are going to get the same benefits going forward and we've also saved the council some money in the renegotiation which i think is positive and helpful um councillor symes nothing to add uh, in which case thank you very much for the update claire that's really really helpful um that takes us to the final item on today's agenda uh the difference claire seafront fees and charges thank you councillor darling so the Seafront Fees and Charters report covers a number of service areas. First, we've got our advertisement posters. And during the year we've had, our posters have been used for reopening food venues, other entertainment venues. And we've supported the COVID messaging, mandatory mask wearing that we've had, healthy lifestyles, exercise, renewable energy, recycling initiatives, and recently this month, the clean air zone. Um, also, we're supporting cultural engagement by our advertising sites covering the city's local cinemas and independent theatres. 
uh, for our posters, we're proposing to increase fees by 9%, including the CPI element, and this is to reflect increased supply costs. So secondly, turning to our beat charts, um, we've undertaken a maintenance programme through this year at all of our sites. Um, at our Lumps Fort site, we've included a number of new doors and new hinges. Um, at our St George's site, we have um, put in new weatherboards and skirting and painting and front panels. And at our Eastney site, uh, where we have had uh, some difficulty with vandalism and antisocial behaviour, um, we have put in replacement shiplap and panels and undertaken paintworks and put in port support posts and we've also repaired the soak away. And there are a number of replacement doors at that site also ongoing. So for our beach huts, we propose to increase the fees by CPI, also to incorporate the current utilities charge because all the huts have the benefit of utilities use and all of them get pat tested. We've also added £40 per hut to allow for maintenance works as part of the ongoing revenue budget. And these adjustments have been made in light of benchmarking against neighbouring authorities. I should point out, in fact, that on the Appendix A, there is a minor typographical error. Um, the charges are accurate, but where it says weekly beach hut resident, that should just say weekly beach hut, because we don't distinguish between resident and non-resident hiring of weekly beach huts. So then turning to the round tower charges, um, the increases in the round tower charges reflect increased staff costs and building maintenance. There remains a reduced charge for the Hot Walls artists to support them and as an incentive to use the Round Tower for creative practice. And uh, this year it's proposed to have three free community uses um, through the year, which is an increase of one use from the previous year. And the last um, aspect of the report I'm going to hand over to my colleague Claire Looney, and this concerns the land hire charges for events. So the third, well, the final part of the um, report that Claire has, we brought together jointly is around the use of the land charges for events. We wanted to simplify our charges and therefore proposed a revision of definitions, which still enables local communities and charitable groups and organizations to benefit from a reduced rate. However, it also acknowledges that we must have a demonstrable evidence of the donations to those charities in order for those organizations to secure the lower rate. This is part of a benchmarking process where we've looked at what other local authorities have done and feel this is very much in line with their processes as well. So overall, this describes the, all the elements within the report and the proposed fees and charges for next year. Okay. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, thank you, Claire and Claire. Um, I don't think there's much to say about seafront charges, to be completely honest. Um, I actually think that we could still charge more, but perhaps I have some middle class bias that I need to get rid of. Um, I, it's, it's a very helpful income stream for the service. Um, I'm not sure I have much else to say. Councillor Symes. <laughs> no, in which case, the new charges are approved as written. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for a wonderful and positive meeting. Thank you. Yes, please. And also, 